So, hello everyone. Welcome uh, to our roundtable. Um, thank you for being here. I'm Alex. I'm a first year IRTS student, uh, International Relations Political Science student. And I also work at the alumni office with uh, Karin and Katarina and Emily, who's not here today. So before introducing the topic and the panelists, some practical information. This session will be recorded for those who could not attend today. There will be a Q&A um, session at the end. So if you are online, you can ask your question in the Q&A section. Yes, there is one. And if you're here, you can raise your hand. You can ask your questions in French or in English. Um, and yeah, so this roundtable is part of the alumni month. Uh, for which we organize a series of roundtables. Um, a quick word uh, on our Empire Student um, project. Every year, the alumni office organizes thematic roundtables through which we want to connect current students with alumni of the Institute to learn from each other. In organizing this event, we collaborate with the career services. In this part. <laughs> And uh, for this event, we collaborate with the Junior Diplomat Initiative. We have some representatives here. So thank you. Thank you to the students, and thank you, Kevin, to moderate this event. So today, we have a great chance. We have, a, we have a, an amazing panel. Um, thank you for being with us today, and thank you, Miguel, for being with us online. Hopefully, you can hear us. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, good, perfect. Hi, okay, we see you. Hello. So now, for the introduction, I'll start with you, Mark. Mark Casser, who is the per uh, permanent observer of the International Development Law Organization, the IDLO, to the United Nations in uh, Geneva. He is a seasoned former U.S. diplomat with more than 25 years of experience. His time at the U.S. Department of State led him to work in Kenya, Ukraine, Namibia, Mozambique, and of course, Switzerland. Mark's first experience in diplomacy was at the mission of South Korea in the, uh, to the UN here in Geneva. He's the third secretary to the permanent mission of Monaco to the UN in Geneva too. Upon graduating, Mathilde joined the Monegasque, Monegasque Foreign Affairs Service and was st stationed in Geneva for her first posting, where she now covers global health and humanitarian affairs. Previously, she worked in various national and international organizations, including the International Telecommunications Union. Welcome, Mathilde, and thank you for being here. Miguel, who graduated from Geneva, from the Geneva Graduate Institute in 2021. He took the diplomatic exam in Spain and got the highest grade, finishing first out of more than 700 candidates. He now works in the Europe Department of the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and his first diplomatic experience was, a was as a liaison officer for the president of Switzerland at the European Political Community Summit in Grenada. Thank you, Miguel, for being here. And last but not least, we have Carolina, who's not here yet, but will join during the roundtable. She began her career at the Swiss Foundation for Child Protection, passed the Concours Diplomatique, the diplomatic exam, in 2008, and entered the FDFA, the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs in 2009. She was posted at the Swiss Embassy in Mexico and the Swiss Mission to the WTO and EFTA, the Swiss Embassy in China, and the Directory for Resources in Bern. In 2019, she changed as Deputy CEO of the Swiss Red Cross, and in March 2024, she became CEO of the Hex Eter, which is the Swiss Church Aid. So without further ado, I'm giving it to you. Thank you. Uh, welcome to everyone who's here, and welcome to everyone who's online. Uh, here in my notes it says Kevin's intro, one minute. And I'm not sure exactly what, uh, what I was supposed to say, but first I want to just introduce the, um, the format for the next uh, I guess 30 or 40 minutes. We're going to ask one general question to all of the four that are going to be with us now. So I'll answer that question, and then each will get an individual question, one more at the end, and then we'll come to Q&A with all of you. If you have questions, write them down, we'll come to them later. Um, just on the topic of why we're here today, diplomacy and all that, I think, well, it's interesting to me, and I'm glad uh, it was chosen, and I admire it. I, from my own country, took the diplomatic exam several times, went through it, 
um, failed several times, finally the last time quit and decided to do something else, but have this distant familiarity with the, with what it's about. I had many friends who did it also, but I think the word diplomat, or I'm working as a diplomat, kind of conjures up lots of images, some Hollywood, some bureaucratic. And I think today will be a great chance to see what it's like from at least four different perspectives. Different countries, seniority levels, um, hopefully both the exciting and the mundane, because it's probably a mix of that in any career. So, that's enough for my one minute intro, I think. Um, and I'll start off with a general question, which I'll ask each of you. Um, we can start with Mark, and then Mathilde, and then Miguel. So, uh, Mark, the first question I'd like to ask is very general. Why did you choose a diplomatic career in the foreign service of your well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here. Really excited to talk to all of you. I love, of course, love, love, love my job. And anytime you like a job, you always want to talk about it. So you'll have to stop me if I go on too long, Kevin. But I think that uh, if you're interested in this career as I was at your age, uh, one of the things I found very hard was to meet diplomats. Uh, I come from a small town in California. We didn't have many diplomats there. You're very lucky here in Geneva. You have them. You can't throw a rock in this town without hitting them. So uh, good to review, good of you to take advantage of the opportunity. But when I think about what really motivated me is I always felt like I wanted to have a career where I could make a difference. Right? It, was, it was as much a vocation as it was a career. And when I looked at the, the things that I was passionate about, which was learning about different people, learning about different cultures, trying to solve problems, trying to figure out how I could make a difference, I thought that one of the ways I could do that was by being a diplomat. And that's because the career is so diverse. There's so many different aspects of being a diplomat and uh, representing that uh, you have opportunities to work in, in either specialized areas or, or general areas. And, and then if uh, you know, you're someone like me who likes to do many different things, you get to bounce around and do those different things and do them in different places and always have to learn, always have to challenge yourself, you always have to figure out how you, can, how you can connect with the people locally. And I think those are all really... Uh, it enthused me when I thought about the career, what I could do, but I, I think that um, uh, we'll have a chance to talk a little more about what those careers look like, but just to answer very briefly, it really was that idea that I could make a difference. I think as a diplomat, you have an ability on the ground, when I served in country and on the ground, to connect with people, help solve problems that you just will never have, I think, in any other career. Um, and why for my country? Uh, I'll be honest with you, I hadn't I had thought a little bit about maybe if I would do something try to like the ICRC, but they didn't allow non-Swiss to do it at that time, or to do some other kind of, of activity that was related to diplomacy. Uh, hadn't really occurred to me too much, uh, so the natural was to do it for my own country, but it was also quite an opportunity, I think, to represent, uh, to represent my country and my fellow countrymen, so I think that was something that... Uh, but to the same question, why did you choose this career? Uh, first, I just want to say hi to everyone, and that I was on this side of the, of the room not long ago, so it feels really weird for me to be here now and speaking to you all, um, but I hope you find this talk useful. Um, so for me, why did I choose this career? Um, at first, I wasn't convinced I wanted to be a diplomat, because as you said perfectly well at the start, it's surrounded by myth and the glamour of it, and um, you don't really know exactly what the job entails, but I knew I was very interested in foreign affairs and just understanding how the world works. So I then decided to focus my studies on foreign affairs, international affairs here at the Institute. And because I was curious about the job, I then tried to have an internship in the field. And that's when I learned a bit more on how it works. And exactly as you said, that's when I realized you are as a diplomat in the room where it happens. Uh, because most processes, especially if you're interested in multilateralism, are really member state led. So um, I realized if I want to then have an impact, uh, it would be probably, at least from my perspective at the time, from, from my state uh, or, or from a country, uh, maybe a more top down approach, but from a country standpoint. And then uh, my country as well is a very small. Place, like Monaco is tiny and I realized as well the responsibilities and opportunities you can have by joining the foreign affairs in it. As an intern I covered many topics and I felt very lucky for it and now as a diplomat we're only three in our mission and I'm working on a very broad range of areas from global health and that entails everything you can think of in global health that 
obviously we don't go as much in depth, but we do cover to a certain extent. And then humanitarian field as well is really, really broad, but I really like this diversity. Um, and to be completely honest with you, it's also opportunities because at the end of my studies here, there was a job opening back home. Uh, because we're a small state, we do have the exam, but we also have from time to time uh, job openings that are more spontaneous. And uh, and I I saw that opportunity, I applied and got the job. So it's also a matter of opportunity. Maybe I wouldn't have ended up there if I had gone through the exam or if I had done something else later. So. Yeah. Thank you. I forgot to say your answers are should be limited to three minutes. Yeah. Great, <laughs> but I should just say. So, last thing again. Um, now that you're aware of the time, um, same question to you. Why did you choose uh, this career? Okay. I hope you can hear me well. First of all. Okay. Perfect. Um, thank you so much to all of you. First of all, for organizing the event. Um, it's so good to see so many familiar faces. I think Karin is there. I think I saw in Mathilde, of course, we were sort of classmates a few, a couple of years ago. So it's now very good to see you again um, on the other side of the road, sort of. Um, in my case, um, it's a very good question, actually. I was always into IR, econ, history, but I never, really knew how to channel all those interests into something really meaningful and at some point of my life diplomacy just made sense um i was into the un i was also into the eu uh being a spanish citizen of course and i was also into sort of the classic bilateral diplomacy and then at some point i thought okay um i was always interested in the history of spain also the eu and i had to find a way to combine those interests in a very sort of proactive, positive and professional way. And at some point, just diplomacy made sense, I think, because um, I studied economics, but then I studied the MIA masters, the back then known as MIA, because I think it's it has a different name now. Right. Yeah. Um, and just combining all those interests uh, at some point, it just made sense to pursue a career in diplomacy. Um, in my case, I also thought of doing EU, uh, but um, just my main concern was the exam, which, as you know, uh, in many different countries is quite difficult. And in our, in our case, it's very difficult. And I was quite afraid of the exam. But um, at some point, I just decided to uh, try pass the exam. And fortunately, I, I, I did. Uh, but it was actually a mix of, I know, different interests and different things I was really interested in. And I thought diplomacy was a very interesting way to sort of combine all those fields. Uh, and um, that's basically what I'm doing right now at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I'm now posted in Madrid, but um, I should be posted somewhere in a few years' time, maybe in a couple of years' time. Uh, but yeah, that's how it actually, um, that's what actually pushed me to try to become a diplomat. And of course, we, we can talk about this later, but uh, the Institute really helped, I think, uh, in so many different ways. have to put on my career advisor hat for a moment and just say for those of you who may be ever facing imposter syndrome sort of you know can I do it am I the right one Miguel said he wasn't sure if you know or he was afraid of the test I think you just said but then I believe you scored first out of 700 plus people who took the test is that right oh uh, yes uh but <laughs> okay. I probably got the grade I probably got that grade because of how afraid and how frightened I was before taking the exam. <laughs> so you sometimes have to, you sometimes have to feel the fear sort of to actually do your best because it, it has to intimidate you. And, but it's not just this exam though. I think any selecting process, like even if you want to pursue a career at the UN and you're also afraid that um, it, might, it might be very competitive, same with EU and same with all the IOs in Geneva. The more afraid you are, I think the more you work on your CV and on your application. And that's how you can actually do your best. Yeah. I was hoping to go for a no fear message, but you went. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks to all of you. Um, Carolina is not with us yet. Not, not yet. Not okay. yet. Okay. We'll move on to the individual questions for our panelists. And we'll start with Mark. We have three minutes, but I think we're doing okay on time. So, Mark. 
Um, with your years of experience in diplomacy with the United States Foreign Service, what kind of skills and experiences do you think would best equip students and graduates to be successful in this field? In other words, what skills should we prioritize? Yeah, so I, if you have met many diplomats, you'll know they're not the most funny people in the world. <laughs> so people like to make fun of us instead. Uh, and somebody uh, finally said, that a diplomat is someone who can tell you to go to hell and make you look forward to the ride. And I think the idea behind that, though, is not that you have to be uh, sarcastic, but that you should learn interpersonal skills first and foremost. I guess the most important skill of a diplomat. It's, uh, you don't build walls of arguments to be right, you build relationships to solve problems. And I think you really have to think about um, if, if you as a person are someone who always tries to understand the perspective of another and internalize that. As a diplomat, you have to defend your national policy. You have to defend your organization's policy. That's, that's what your job is. But the way you best do that is by understanding the needs and concerns of the others so that you can find common solutions. And that's not easy, especially when you don't understand their cultural context, you don't understand their history, you don't have the same understanding of... of their own family relationships and the things that make them tick. You have to learn those things. So I think the interpersonal relationships are absolutely, absolutely critical. Uh, and I always like to say, I and mean, every time people come to the to to the you know join the U.S. mission, I give the same lecture to everyone. I'd start off by saying kindness matters. Be good, be courteous, be professional, be considerate of others, different opinions, diversity. And that's kind of a starting point with how I think it is that you have to engage in diplomacy. The next level of diplomacy, though, is really you do have to know your brief. It's important to understand when you want to, you know, so Miguel takes a test. What did he do? He studied, you know, he got his butterflies in alignment and he studied hard, even though he was afraid of it. But he learned the, learned the material, and that's why I think what's really critical to diplomat. Another skill I would say is writing. Uh, you have to be able to write well. And, and I think that's, I can't underestimate, under, understate that. I think there's, a, I know people apply for positions or they, that I've worked with, the ones that manage to articulate their arguments and thoughts well are the ones that are able to prevail very often, and that's very frequently done in writing. I'd also add another, another skill, and that's just practical. You have common sense. Are you able to try to understand how things operate in the real world? Uh, I, I know that uh, you know, I studied game theory and everything else that many of you probably had to do here at the Graduate Institute. No, no disrespect to the Graduate Institute or for the, for the academic rigor that that implies, but I didn't ever use game theory in, in my career. Uh, but what I did have to do is try to figure out how to solve problems and how to do it practically and how to, how to make sure that I was working with people to find those solutions. Uh, so I've probably gone on for three minutes at a minimum of that, but I'll, so I'll stop there. We can talk more on this. Good. It might be fun by saying this, but I'm not fun. So. My only fun line is everyone to get me all day. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that's a great answer. Uh, Mathieu, so next to you. So as a relatively recent graduate in September 2022, I believe, yeah, how did you navigate the shift from academia to practice in your first real job in the diplomatic space with the Foreign Affairs Service at Monaco? Have you faced any challenges and how are you overcoming them? Yeah, so as I said, for me, it did come a bit as a surprise to get this job. I got it quite quickly, and I was actually thinking of continue, continuing my studies after the institute. I had applied to do that, and uh, I was actually focusing on sustainability here, climate governance, and I was going to pursue that after. I did have, in the long run, the uh, goal to do the diplomatic uh, service or try the exam. So when I saw this opportunity, I applied because I thought it will uh, maybe put my name in the system and also seeing how it works. And so when it did work out, and then uh, also the position was for European multiculturalism, it wasn't so rare. I was then told Geneva, it did work really well. But it's true, I was then uh, you know, having to adapt very quickly on the new environment and also new topics, because as I said, I was doing health and I had never studied health before. So a uh, lot of learning on the job, and I think that was the main challenge. It was very being very adaptable to the situation, very very versatile as well. Uh, I think that's a skill that diplomats uh, seem to need as well, because you're often given short notice on things. Um, and I, at least for Monaco, but I think other missions as well, 
you're up and covering when you're sent somewhere for the person who left and it's not necessarily going to be your uh, your field of expertise but i think from what i learned it's not all about being an expert or knowing uh, really your topic well because you'll have the people in capital supporting you with knowledge it's more about how you convey the information how you share it how you go and talk to people to get the information so yeah the, the main challenge was adapting to all those changes second of all putting myself out there going create my network um, and uh, and having those interpersonal skills that I needed to develop as well, because it started from scratch. The person left, she had her network, I had to come and create my own. And especially as Monaco, you're a small state, people are not coming to you with information, or uh, you're not in the room with the G20, G7. <laughs> um, you have to go and talk to people and be kind enough that they want to share with you uh, whatever they may be useful. Um, and uh, I think another uh, challenge that I then had was linked to writing, actually, was uh, being very concise, being very practical, because in academia, you're often having to share your own point of view in a very academic way, and with thesis and all. But in the diplomatic job, you have to share your state's point of view, so also in terms of moral um, aspect, it might not necessarily align. And you have to be very concise, very practical in how you speak and how you write. So that was also a bit of adaptation. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I may, if I may quickly, do I still have time? Mm -hmm. <laughs> One other challenge I had, I think, um, I don't want to be cliche, but I think it's also being a young woman on the job as a diplomat. When I arrived, it was very often the case that I would be considered as an intern by default. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to impose yourself to be taken seriously. Uh, and I think also being in Geneva, it's usually a more senior role, so it's there's a bit of an age gap. So to uh, kind of develop those interpersonal connections, uh, you really need to put yourself out there as well uh, and say I'm as legitimate as this other third secretary that's traveled the world and is now in, in Geneva. Uh, so yeah, and as a young woman, I do want to highlight. I think it is a hard, uh, hard job. So um, yeah, just to. It, it can feel very solitary sometimes because you're representing a country. You don't necessarily have those support groups uh, like friends because each person is a state as well. Um, and uh, and I think it's a uh, yeah. I mean, it's a good learning. I think with time you you actually overcome them as well. You learn how to. Thanks. I think it's interesting. Just reflect. We have probably a country with the largest foreign services in the world. Probably one of the smallest, if referring to Monaco as a small country. I imagine there's differences in your career, whether you work for a large country or a small country, and your career path, and what you do. And what, yeah. We don't have time for that question, but if you're able to slip it into your answer, that would be very curious. Yeah. Okay, but let's move on. Uh, Miguel, I know you're there, and so I'm coming to you now. Um, Miguel, you have just begun your first post with the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs in September 2023, six months ago approximately. On a practical level, can you describe to us what is an average day like in your shoes at this early point in your career? Where do you go to work? Who do you interact with? What, what do you actually do um, on a daily basis? Right. So, um, so in our ministry, in our case, the Europe department is different to the EU sort of department. So in my case, I'm the Euro department. What we basically do is we manage and we deal with the bilateral relationship of Spain with all European countries. That includes, of course, Switzerland, UK, and countries which are a part of the EU. So in my case, I am right now the desk officer for eight countries, which is a lot. Um, some in interesting countries. Um, I'm, for instance, in charge of Poland and Hungary. And especially Hungary is giving us a lot of work uh, recently, as we can get. Um, so it's quite interesting. And I would say the three thing, the two, three things we do is, first thing is we prepare and we organize all the meetings of the our director, the secretary of state and the foreign minister with uh, the European counterparts, be it another secretary of state, another minister, another director, etc. That also includes all the visits by uh, and the state trips of uh, the king. So every any time the king travels to a European country, we have to prepare the dossier and the talking points. And also applies to a foreign minister. So every time the foreign minister 
as a uh, bilateral meeting or a pull aside with the German foreign minister, the French foreign minister, we have to prepare the dossier uh, with all the talking points. The second thing would be coordination and outreach to embassies, both European embassies in Madrid and our embassies in Europe, because uh, they need the support and also the expertise to advance some important dossiers. And the third thing would be to keep track of the sort of political agenda of all those countries. So in my case, uh, since I'm in charge of also Austria, Denmark, Hungary, Poland, etc., we would also have meetings with the embassies, uh, prepare the talking points for the minister, as I said, so to keep track of our bilateral relationship. That's what we do in the Europe Department, which is different compared to the EU sort of department, which is more technical. It's got more to do with internal market, enlargement, etc., um, and uh, that's basically what we do at the department, which is, as you know, is very different compared to what you do in an embassy uh, when you're posted overseas. What we call these sort of bilateral embassies in in some countries where you have to, where you have the ambassador and the deputy chief of mission. Um, one of the most interesting things uh, that I'm going to have to do in the next few weeks, in my case, uh, we have the graduation ceremony coming up, and I've had to. This is very weird, but I had to prepare a speech, which I have to give before the king. Um, and uh, that's something you're not really prepared to do. Like the exam doesn't prepare you to do that. Uh, but at some point you have to improvise, I assume. Uh, so that's one of the other things that I'm having to do uh, in the last few days. It's just to get this speech right um, so I can give it properly before the king in a, in a few weeks' time. <laughs> Don't forget, Miguel, fear is motivating. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly, yes. Thank you so much. I think that's very interesting. I just want to ask, is uh, Mathilde, uh, sorry, uh, Carolina with us? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, shall we wait before moving on so we can include her or no? She said she will join at one, right? Yes, yeah. she so we can wait. Can, can I, I, further or? I, I mean, I have a question. If we yeah, can just go ahead, sure. So the idea of you're posted here in Switzerland and Miguel, you're currently, I guess, at home in your own country. Mark, you spent time in bilateral missions or posted abroad. How, how different is the experience? I'll address this to Mark because you've done it being posted to uh, smaller countries, bigger countries, smaller offices, consulates, as opposed to embassies. Does it affect your work and, of course, your lifestyle and everything that goes along with it? How is that different from being posted, maybe, we call it headquarters, where, for example, Miguel is or to it's very different. It, it is uh, doesn't have to be, but it's it's. I found it to be very different. When you're posted to an embassy overseas, you're. I always found it to be more hands-on. You have to go out, and make the counter, meet the counterparts, engage with people, understand what the problems are, and try to solve. Because there's always issues you have to raise. There's bilateral things you want to promote, so you're doing a lot of whether it's business promotion for commercial offices, or you're doing consular work where you're addressing your own citizens' needs, or dealing with visas, or you're working on an economic issue where you have to try and figure out what's going on with the economy of your country or political issues. So those things happen at the, at the country level when you're in an embassy in a much more sort of hands-on way, where you're interacting with the counterparts, you're reporting back to your capital and feeding the information back to them. Whereas when you're in the capital, very often you are providing the almost the back office services to a large extent, but it's not uniquely that. There's also a lot of policy making that happens there, so you have to, you have to, you know, like he says, he writes, Miguel has to write up the briefing for the Secretary of State. Well, that's because they're traveling, they need to know what to talk about, and you need to have it in a very concise format, so you're, 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 you're serving the machine uh, in a different way when you're at the Capitol, and you can be involved in policy making a little bit more, but you're also a lot of paperwork that you have to do because you are preparing so many briefings and materials. And so in a simplistic sense, that's how I always found it to be. I personally found the work in embassies to be more motivating and interesting because that's I like living overseas. I like learning languages. I like meeting different people. And that gave me the opportunity to do that. So I thrived in that environment. I know other people who love the policy making. They love the bureaucratic fighting to get to the right the right answer. And they really they, they thrive on that. And they did well back in capital. So it's a, a bit about your own personality. And is this considered a Hosting than you in Switzerland, and is there for a small country like Monaco? Because I, I know that in bigger countries, with the rotation system and so forth, will it be the same for you? Will you have to go home regularly, or will this? What what comes after your first foreign hosting? 
so so for Monaco, because it's so small and we don't have so many so many resources as well in terms of people to recruit from, mm -hmm. they have this exam every year and then we're recruiting sometimes when we need someone to come in for the Spain that's uh, locally hired. So I was hired from Monaco from the Ministry of Affairs and went through a very short explaining training at home where they teach you also how the system works, meeting all the very key people you'll be in touch with when you're sent abroad. And then I was sent here. Um, we have uh, not that many missions abroad with Monaco. We're only having a few in the main capital cities of Europe. And then uh, outside of Europe, it's actually the US, one in Washington and then one in New York. Uh, the other missions for the rest of the world are actually based in Monaco. It's uh, offices. It's very small. <laughs> so, uh, so for me, uh, I, I know going on the job that there is a rotation system happening. So basically, in five years or so, I'll be asked to move, and I don't really know when. I know roughly where, since the options are limited for for my country, uh, and. Uh, and then it also depends on the opportunities at the time, who has gone where, if some people have retired or left. So, Only offices in Europe and the US. Yeah, yeah, uh, missions. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah, so. Uh, Is anyone else here from a very small country? Out of curiosity. I mean, maybe not as small as Monaco. It's a nice one. You have a question. Oh, go ahead. Can I? Is it time? Sure, sure. Um, so I wanted to know, we all have our own personal beliefs. And in français, on dit qu'il n'y a rien de plus nationaliste, peut-être, ou patriotique qu'un qu diplomate. Parce que no matter what like position your government is taking, you have to defend that. That's your job. And that might differ with your own opinion sometimes. How do you deal with that? You have the same question online. Okay. <laughs> Shall we start with Miguel? Because he hasn't started just yeah. gone with you too. Miguel, would you like to go first? Please? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, that's a very good question, especially when I think it really depends if, if your national sort of politics is polarized or it isn't. Now, nowadays, it, it, it's all very polarized. So every time a government wants to pass a law or there is a very controversial debate about something, that forces diplomats and public servants generally to implement what the government wants to do. But it's about implementation of something. And what you get to see in that case is all the difficulties that might be attached to one specific dossier and how difficult it is to implement that. For instance, that's a very interesting question because we were asked recently in a trip to Croatia, we had a meeting with, the, with some advisors to the prime minister and the president. We were asked about our opinion, personal opinion during the meeting on the amnesty law that has just been passed by the Spanish government for the Catalan uh, politicians that organized the referendum in 2017. So that really gets into the actual nitty gritty of domestic politics and no matter what you think about it, you just have to defend in a very subtle, intelligent, professional way what the government stands for, but also, at the, on the other hand, what's legal. So you really have to find the right words to not just to parrot, sort of, to repeat what the government says, but also to do it sort of diplomatically and to explain it in a way that would actually allow other governments and other countries to know what's behind what politicians say. And I think, that's, I, think, I think that's the magic or the secret of diplomacy. It's not just to repeat what politicians say, but to portray it in a way that your counterpart knows what you're talking about in a deeper and much more meaningful and fundamental way. So to use different words sometimes to explain yourself better and to sort of channel and send a very specific, specific message based mostly on history and law and not necessarily politics and i think that gives you much more leverage and that allows your counterpart to actually know what's going on it's a big challenge though i assume Mathilde and mark will have similar experiences with maybe their own countries yeah, why don't you chime in and then we'll move on because it was asked online yes i did but shall we just answer it and then yeah 
Uh, th this is the probably the first question I always get whenever I talk to groups of students that are in, or anybody who's interested in becoming a diplomat. And I think as a U.S. diplomat, that's uh, we're set, have such a visible presence around the world with so many activities that this issue does come up fairly frequently. That said, I'll, I'll build on what Miguel was saying. I think it's really important to recognize, first of all, that you do represent not just your country, your government, you represent your, the people of your country. You're a representative of your country overall. And so I always found it extremely helpful to explain to others why. If you can explain why, you have a much more interesting conversation with somebody. It's not pure defense. It's not the defending that politicians make one decision or another. It's explaining, well, the way things work in my country is that we have elections. We have you know, voters that think this way. We have a reflection of other things that are happening around the world. Whether, uh, whether you know, I like it or not, I don't like it, this is the reality. So how are we going to go forward? How are we going to find a solution to, to, to address the things that we're facing? Because it's going to have, they're clearly raising it because it has an impact on them as well. And so I think that really is important. And I think it's also, in a place like Geneva, everyone knows that you represent your, your, your country. And they know that you're speaking on behalf of your government. And they, and they know that. And I think there's still a very deep respect for diplomats who do it well. Uh, I think this is where I go back to interpersonal skills. If you just try to say, you know, I'm right, or our position is, and you want to pound the table, which I've seen happen, which is stunning, I mean, from diplomats, but it does happen, nobody will listen to you, they won't believe you, and then they're going to personalize it against you. Whereas if you explain and engage, you have a much more deep, deep conversation about the reality of the world as it is, not uh, just trying to feel like you have to defend a policy. One last thing, though, is if you truly very much just personally cannot tolerate defending a certain policy, then you have to question whether or not that's the right place for you to be. And in my case, I um, purposely chose some assignments knowing that I could defend whatever was going on there. If I And I maybe didn't serve and, and deal with other issues uh, because of that. When you get more senior, it's a little more complicated. Uh, but then, you know, I, you have enough season and, and experience to manage that. Maybe very quickly. I think that's a very good bridge as well to the last question on working in IOs versus in states. Because I guess that's good. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I was uh, just wanted to add the thing on uh, really separating the person versus the state and your statement is very important because at least in my short experience, you often have. Uh, corridors discussion where people have other personal opinions, but then it is their state's uh, position, so they they defend it in that way. But then that's actually where the interesting negotiation happened, because maybe they have room for leverage on their end as well, and then they have also a little bit of, of uh, like room for maneuver on also influencing their own domestic politics. So I think that's, that's the interesting bit. Uh, I do think, though, if, if you have more yeah, political stance and, and more... Uh, uh, yeah, strong uh, opposition to what your country uh, thinks. It's it would be a very difficult job to to go with. Just, uh... Thank you guys, and thanks for allowing a brief detour. Uh, help! Oh, there is girl. She's up there. Fantastic. Do you, uh, Alexi? Do you want to introduce her briefly, like you did for the others, uh, or shall I do that? She did it. I did it already, oh, but I did. can. Oh. Well, okay, I was really thinking about what I was going to say. While <laughs> uh, Carolina, welcome. Uh, nice to have you joining us. So we're at the stage in the presentation where we're asking each panelist an individual question, and all the others have gone, so it's your turn now. Uh, so welcome, and I have a question. You can hear me? You're doing good? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, Hi, so everyone. Carolina, you have worked for uh, a number of different organizations over your career including I believe, about 10 years as a Swiss diplomat, um, as well as stints, uh, you know, work period at several Swiss foundations and organizations. Um, what are some of the specificities that made your work in the Foreign Service as a diplomat unique compared to the other roles? Um, I have not heard everything that you were discussing before, but uh, the last part of the discussion that I've heard is uh, very important. And there I can really um, underline also, yes, it is important that you um, differ between the role and opinion that you have as a person and that 
the one that you are representing. And I think this is not only true for the diplomacy, but it's also true for institutions at large that you might represent or um, work for. And this is one of the um, competences that for sure I've learned in the diplomacy and that you can use um, wherever you go afterwards. But I think it's not the only one, but the most important um, what I took from the diplomacy to the rest of my work is that you learn to listen. So a good diplomat in the first place is a good listener. Um, why? Because he has to understand where the other person is coming from, the interests that the other person has to um, represent, the red lines or not red lines, and uh, the so-called poker face. Um, this is playing with a lot of um, people, but diplomats are usually able to decipher or uh, read these poker faces. And this is something that helps you afterwards uh, in all your profession. So um, negotiation is something else that uh, it's um, key for diplomats, but it's also key in all other relations that you have in professional life, because it's always about finding the best solution. The best, best solution is usually something that you have to negotiate because you don't know it in the beginning, what will be the optimal solutions for all partners. And when you have at the table the different um, interests and you're able to understand the different interests, the ones that are explicit and also the ones that are implicit, um, then you are good positioned for finding a solution that will fit for everybody. So from this um, point of view, these 10 years in diplomacy have uh, educated me for everything else that I do things because there are some key competences that you can use everywhere and it's uh, giving you an advantage when your peers do not have this. So I don't know if this is answering your question. I think it's great. Yeah, great job jumping right in. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, so um, we'll just enter the final phase. I'm going to ask, this is called discussion between panelists, so you're able to talk to each other in this period too. Basically, I'll ask the same question to, to each of you. Stepping back a little bit, acknowledging that diplomacy can be many different things. The question is, I'll ask Mark first, why did you choose a career in diplomacy in a national foreign service for the United States, in your case, versus working in an IO as an international civil servant, for example, at the UN or something? What was your motivation there? If you're going to go first, it's kind of like, uh, have you ever seen the movie Rocky, you know, and he goes and tells the old guy to go before in the ring if they were to for me? Uh, so you set, set me off to the. Uh, so I, I, I think I'll be very brief because I did touch on this a little bit, the difference between sure. national and, and I think that there are, um, uh, with your national foreign service, you are obviously doing the bilateral angle. Uh, you can work, though, in the bilateral capacity at the multilateral institutions. So as a diplomat working for my country, I was able to serve twice in Geneva, and I had both, uh, you know, that, that you represent your country to the international organization, which is, is it different from the type of work you do when you're doing it bilaterally in a country. And I think that is something we could talk a little more about uh, if people are interested later. Uh, that said, with the multilateral, now that I work for an international organization, uh, I can see there's a few things that are, that are different. Um, first of all, we, I was very dependent on a certain structure and a certain way of moving around the world with the National Foreign Service. That can be very different depending upon what type of multilateral organization you're going to work for. Uh, you still do diplomacy, though. A lot of what I do in my day-to-day -day job is relational. It has to do with finding solutions. It has to do with helping countries for their development purposes, for rule of law issues. So you can find in the international organizations a, 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 a sort of um, a type of work that may be a little more of greater interest to you that you want to maybe specialize in or that you want to pursue. And I think that's something also that the international organizations, in some cases, you might even be able to stay a little longer in some places, depending upon the organization, which we haven't talked about families yet. I'm sure we will in Q&A, but that can have an impact as well. So that depends upon you. You have to know yourself, know who you are, know what really motivates you, understand what your own National Foreign Service would offer and provide in terms of moving around or not moving around or the types of jobs that they offer, uh, and then think about what an international organization could do in that regard. So, so. I forgot this is supposed to be unstructured. So would anyone else like to chime in? I won't call on any one of you, this question, including Nicole. 
why choose a career with a national foreign service as opposed to an IO or vice versa? Maybe if I, I may, I, I do think nationality really matters. Uh, I think a bit as I touched upon earlier that if you're someone who uh, prefers to have an expertise in something versus having a more broad uh, interdisciplinary approach, obviously that would depend also on your country, but as a diplomat, I think you have more of this broader view, perhaps, on, on different uh, uh, yeah, fields, whereas maybe when you're in IO, I might be wrong, <laughs> jumping to, to correct me, but uh, it feels you, you have more opportunity to, to be uh, having your impact on the ground, seeing more concrete aspects of, of your job and also uh, using this expertise a bit further. And, uh, and maybe uh, I feel also, on, again, with personality, if, if you work for an IO, you might be able to have this job in this city for a while. Um, whereas, again, with diplomacy, in most countries we have this mobility element. So again, if you're perhaps uh, more keen on being curious around the world and traveling, that might work better versus if you're um, more interested in, in growing in your career in one organization, uh, then an IO route might work better. I'm also very interested in hearing what Carolina or think about that, because that's just my perspective so far. But... If, I can, if I can just jump in. Um... It's a very, it's a very important, very interesting question. I think it really depends on where you feel more comfortable personally, and also intellectually, because I think it changes just working in a multilateral environment compared to a sort of bilateral setting. Um, I think if you want to do the National Foreign Service, work in the National Foreign Service, you first need to have a sort of in, genuine interest in the history of your country. Because at the end of the day, you're gonna, you're going to be the voice of your country, and there are all sorts of ideas and thoughts that people have about about your own country, and your job is going to be to confirm the positive thoughts they have about the country and to change the negative thoughts they might have about your own country and your own culture. So you have a little, you have a high degree of responsibility upon your shoulders when you do the National Foreign Service. Also multilaterally, uh, I think there are two advantages. I mean, just the way I see it. The first one is you can also work at the UN, NATO, and the human rights when you work at the National Foreign Service, because you can be posted, you know, like Mark, you can be posted to all Mathilde, you can be posted to Geneva, you can do multilateral issues, but then in a few years time, just be posted to a bilateral embassy. And I think that's a, you know, dynamic, um, of the dynamism of the diplomatic career is very interesting. And the second thing is, I have the feeling you can also, uh, this is what went through my mind when I was trying to figure out if I wanted to do EU, if I wanted to do Spain. I sometimes thought, as much as I like the EU dossier and the technical stuff, I the idea of making a difference as a representative of my country felt much more attractive to me than working at the EU personally, because you might be in a circumstance in which you are posted to one country where there is no ambassador and you are the chasse d'affaires. And in that case, or if the ambassador is gone and you're the only one staying at the embassy for a month, you are Spain, literally. Uh, you're the voice of Spain. You are going, I mean, this might sound this might sound really exaggerated, but in a way, you are being the representative of your country, and it's just you, and you have to get the best version out of yourself and the best version out of your country to convey that message and to work on whatever dossier you are um, preparing those days. So, I think there's sometimes that degree of responsibility and that you know, awareness of the history of your country, the interest, the culture, the economics, all the companies, etc., that makes this path, the National Foreign Service, very attractive. But at the same time, it gives you lots of responsibility. And I just gave the example of, you know, when you are maybe chasse d'affaires in one country, but that might well happen at some point. You might have a coup d'etat, you might have an earthquake, and you have to assist your own citizens and you have to be the one that actually um, provides that service because that's basically why you 
you know, what, or I, in my case, pick this career is just vocation of service. And you really have to put that into practice in very difficult circumstances, including, you know, as I said, maybe could attack earthquake, etc. So I think that perspective is different compared to IOs. And it struck me as particularly interesting. Carolina, anything to add? Um, yes. I have to say I have uh, enjoyed both. I have done uh, four years in Geneva and I have done uh, Beijing and um, headquarters and Mexico also. Um, but the multilateral, I have to say, it's much more fascinating. So when you have done once multilateral um, diplomacy, I think it's difficult to go then to bilateral because bilaterally you have one um, uh, vice versa, uh, one um, uh, part on, on on the opposite side and not 190. And um, I had an ambassador that uh, Geneva that told me it's when you have a multinational um, negotiation, it's like you have to play chess with 190 different partners and them, they have also a chess board with 190 partners and you have to find out what is the game you have to play in order to uh, win what you want to um, achieve. And I think this is very clearly showing the complexity, but also the interesting thing and how you are um, navigating in such a um, complex structure. And for Switzerland, of course, not being part of the EU, a small country, having um, uh, less and less also the, the um, how do you say, the access to information, or it was when I left like this. Um, it's important to have your connections, your um, sources that you have only on trust built, that you get the information needed in order to be able to um, uh, make an influence and having an impact and uh, going in the direction that you want to achieve. And for this, um, I would suggest to everybody that starts with diplomacy to look for an assignment in uh, Geneva or New York or um, Vienna because it's extremely interesting and you learn extremely much. And then everything that is bilateral is getting more easy to understand. Of course, uh, if you are a small country and you have to negotiate with a huge um, partner in front, <coughs> it's always another thing than when you are um, on the same level. There you have another possibility to reach things. So um, for me, the multilateral has for sure given me the most out of the career. Thank you so much, um, all of you. I think we go now to the Q&A. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> thank you very much. Fascinating discussion. I really love it. I see a pattern here in terms of uh, career, starting the career, advancing and so on. My question is more about um, how open the system is to people from outside, people that have been in the business world for 10, 5, 15 years. They had a huge responsibility that had a switch to go to this, uh, you know, kind of a, a new career. How flexible? If you've seen anything, can you give some examples and so on? Because you all had your life built in, in this world, but for people from outside, how do you go in? Anyone? <laughs> Any questions? Or... Am I moderating? Doing okay. Ah, okay. There um, is no, no questions online. Maybe I'm uh, just looking at Mark because he probably saw a lot. Yeah, this... yeah. Uh, so I think you, you raise an interesting question because it's not uh, obvious necessarily to enter. And there are some, so for example, I have friends of mine who started second careers in the U.S. State Department and they had to start at the bottom. Because you take the entrance test and you start as somebody as all the other people who started that are, you know, maybe 15, 20 years younger. And you go through that. There are sometimes opportunities to do mid career hirings that, that can help to start at a different place. The career is very, it's, it depends on your national service. Similarly, with the international organizations, uh, it can also be very difficult to break in uh, if you don't start early in the career because. Often you look at their qualifications and they'll ask for somebody who has X number of years working for, lo and behold, the very organization you're applying to uh, for that kind of job. And so I think you need to be able to 
had the entry points. And so um, one of the things you can do sometimes for entry points, I found, is to, for international organizations at least, is to go work in the field. So humanitarian uh, operations or field operations, there's often a need for people who are adventurous and ready to roll up their sleeves and go someplace, to, a difficult place often to get the job done. And that can sometimes create the bridge to get into the organization and or even just to build up your resume to then apply maybe for your national foreign service or your, your national diplomatic service in some capacity. I'll also say there's another area that we haven't talked about that exists, which is uh, very often you have a, uh, a career foreign service that goes abroad, but you also have a civil service that supports all the diplomacy back from the HQ. Those can also be interesting diplomatic positions as well. And that does get people, maybe especially those who don't necessarily want to travel all the time, uh, but can anchor them into diplomacy from the home office side. And in many foreign services and in, in national diplomatic services, you can actually then have an assignment, maybe that would go overseas or do something that sort of gets yourself in the door. So I, there's a lot of different ways. I think what thing you probably are taking away from this conversation, it's an incredibly diverse field. I think we tend to think of diplomacy as this thing where a diplomat goes represents the country overseas to an embassy. It's much more diverse than that. So if you're interested in diplomacy, I really would encourage you to do a little bit of research on all that entails. I mean, I know some services are very small and it is a little more restricted. Some are very big and they have all kinds of things. You could become a specialist in, you know, international space negotiations. I mean, this exists, right? This is a thing. So um, you want to look. So, so I wouldn't assume that all the doors are closed, but it is true that it's a little bit different. We'll have an ambassador to Mars one day, all of us. <laughs> have to add a course here, I guess, so the international people. That's great. Thank you, uh, Carolina, because you've moved around a lot. Do you want to add something about entry points and entering from other careers? Yes, maybe to add, um, I totally agree what was told. Unfortunately, I would say that you have to start um, at scrap when you are starting the career. I've never understood this because I started with already having uh, quite a lot of um, uh, experience, but it's true. You start as a stagiaire and you are on the bottom line and then you have to grow inside the career. And it does not matter if you have already um, part of your career behind you. And um, this I don't find a very apt system for using all the competences that are in the diplomatic service. But I have also to say that um, it's quite a closed um, society. How do you say this? Uh, so diplomats are among themselves quite uh, homogeneous and are cl quite closed, even when they are uh, able to have good relationships to others. So. It's clear, for example, in the Swiss diplomatic service that you enter once and usually you are um, going to the retirement out of the diplomatic service. So what I have done to leave after 10 years, it's totally something um, that you don't do usually. And um, you also feel it socially because uh, you leave a career and this gives the impression for the ones that are staying um, that you don't appreciate enough this career. Very special. Usually when you um, leave another company, um, they were happy that you were there and they understand that you leave. This is with the foreign service a bit different. It might change with the years, but it's still um, a cultural thing that is there. So this means also that when you are coming later, for example, in the Swiss uh, diplomatic service, I had my last assignment was doing um, reform of the HR and the personnel and how to uh, make the career. And there we introduced the possibility that you can come in mid service or mid um, career in uh, the diplomatic service, also with a concours and so on. But of course, when you're then coming in, uh, in your 40s, and you have uh, built your experience somewhere else, you will still feel that you are not part of the ones that are there since 15 years and you don't have the same skills uh, negotiation wise, but maybe you have a lot of other skills. But um, the question is how much they will be appreciated or not. And there I'm sure that the diplomatic services have to um, develop also themselves in order to get more open, more inclusive, um, benefit more of different experiences because um, the problems to be solved become more and more complex 
and to be always in the same field and among the same years might not be uh, useful in future to be able to bring the added value that is necessary as a diplomat. But this is important to have in mind in case you want to join the diplomatic service uh, later in your life, that it might be not a real open welcoming structure also because your experience might bring you on a position where you are already higher in the in the career so getting one of the nice positions and the others that are there since 15 or 20 years um, aspire a long time for these positions and might be a bit jealous if you get it so these are things to be or keeping in mind and to understand that it's uh, still quite a hierarchical career, um, having some positions that are more attractive than others. Reached 1.30, shall we continue? Yeah, I think there are questions. Yes, I would like to ask the famous family question, which we already touched up on before. Because I feel like for many people, it's a very attractive career. But what holds many people back is this idea of moving around all the time, not only us, but also maybe with like a future family or a partner. So I was wondering, um, from your experience, how easy is it to combine private life and being a diplomat? And what are the obstacles and uh, maybe also the downsides in this regard of the career? Uh, to anyone. <laughs> maybe we start with those. I think Mark, with you. Yeah, as the veteran here. Uh, yeah, so my wife and, and I have always looked at this as something we've done together. And I always made it very clear to her and to my family that if this didn't work for the family, it didn't work for me. I'll be honest, I'm probably a little unusual in that regard. I think people that enter this business sometimes have very high career ambitions and, they, and that drives them a lot. It can be difficult on families. I did, however, before I even joined the Foreign Service, I wanted, to ask the, I wanted to find out the answer to that same question. I had a very difficult time finding diplomats, but I did find them, and I wanted to talk to their kids who were in their late 20s and 30s, and I asked them all, how was it? And it was very interesting. I found three or four children of diplomats, and they all gave me the same answer. It was really hard at times, but I would not exchange the experience for anything in the world. Now, that said, you have to be very aware of the kids and how the kids respond to it, because it's not for everyone. Just because you like moving around and bouncing from one place to the next doesn't mean that, that, you know, that you're going to. Like I said, my wife's had to change jobs every time we have moved. And she is uh, more qualified and competent than I'll ever be. And she's had to suck it up and do that. And that's, so that's something we've done as a family. But you know, one of the reasons I transitioned from the National Foreign Service to go work for an I.O. to be able to stay in one place so we can have a little more stability. And that's, uh, so I think it is absolutely doable. I think there are other issues that you want to talk about, especially as a woman, uh, to be perfectly honest. We may not like to say that, but it's the truth. Uh, that it's a, it can be challenging sometimes in certain countries where you're not even allowed to drive or you're not allowed to, to do certain things or just making sure that, you know, if you want to continue your career. I was very pleased in my career to see that there were an increasing number of, of trailing spouses that were men. Really, it's, it, so it is changing. It, it's improving. But there's still a sort of historical, sort of stereotypical things there. So. Um, I'm sure that others will have something to add, but I, I would just advise, once again, self-awareness, know who you are, know what it is that you want, and then make sure that if you want to have a family and you want to have a spouse, talk to them, really understand what that means before you, you make the commitments, either way, to join a foreign service or to be with somebody who may or may not be ready for that, because it has a massive impact. It's very stressful sometimes. They say marriage, death, and moving are some of the most stressful things that you'll face in your life. Just maybe to get a bit more detail, does the Foreign Service in your country I mean, support the family to come along, jobs, or housing, anything? Because one is agreeing to do it, one is doing it. What kind of support do you get? Anyone can chime in. But... Um, yeah. in, in, the case of, in the case of Spain, I think there's a slew, there's a slew of policies to ensure this sort of work-life balance especially for diplom diplomats posted overseas. Although, since we don't formally have a well-established union at the ministry, it's 
getting more and more difficult to get more benefits out of the Secretary of State and the Foreign Minister. So that's a problem when it comes to negotiating with them. But that it's true there are more and more policies and also for diplomats who are, you know, career diplomats who are a couple. And for instance, when they apply to postings and um, jobs overseas and embassies, etc., they now can do what we call the sort of the matching process through which if someone gets posted to one country, the other will try to be posted to a country close to the other one so they can be close to each other. So to a neighboring country, for instance, if someone goes to Austria, uh, then the ministry will try to post the other person to Germany or to Italy. That's one example to make sure that they are actually close. But um, in, in in our case, we 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 still try to negotiate with the with the foreign ministry to get more money, especially for instance for schooling uh, and different benefits. But uh, on the other hand, yeah, there there are quite a few policies in place uh, to make sure that people can actually um, have a more sort of stable balance. Although there's still the feeling that if you are married to a diplomat. Uh, sometimes it is as if you had to renounce on your career, which doesn't necessarily have to be true, but there's always that feeling. And in terms of mental health and support, etc., we still have a long way to go, at least in our ministry, to make sure that there is that needed cohesion within families and to make sure that it is actually not just affordable, but also um, sustainable from a you know mental point of view, from a family yeah. point of view, etc., so it's a debate, actually. There's a debate going on on how to make all these things smoother and, you know, more more practical on a daily basis. Do you want to add something? Uh, maybe quickly, uh, yeah, just a quickly follow up on what you were saying. You can at least, uh, from my experience, really feel that it's a, it was a male-dominated uh, field in that sense that uh, the system in place is uh, is more for the old historical diplomat that you can think of where it's uh, the man that does all the negotiation and then his wife is at home with the, uh, the residents or the ambassadors with, with the kids. So I think this is changing though. We are seeing way more women in diplomacy and uh, there are more systems uh, that are adapting to it. Um, I, I don't know that many countries that have a lot of support for the, for the partners. Um, but again, yeah, it's something to be very transparent on with, with your partner and seeing if their career can align with it, seeing if they're in a way uh, okay with perhaps sacrificing, going up in the ladder for moving horizontally with you uh, from one country to another. Um, but it is, it is something that works and that is reconciled because I've seen around me lots of, of colleagues, especially in Geneva, there are lots of people with families. And I think it's also learning about the flexibility of your own system, uh, because if you speak a lot of times, at least uh, from what I've heard, people listen. So if you have a special case, you have kids, they will try maybe and be flexible, send you in less complicated places. Um, for us at home, there is the option of being sent back to capital temporarily and then you go back abroad. Uh, so it's not ideal, but there are little uh, things that slowly help. Carolina, you want to add something? Yes, um, yes, I can uh, join what was told so far. I think it's um, a huge challenge to have a family in the diplomatic service as you have to move. And um, usually you cannot really choose where you move and when you move. So there's a given uh, time frame. And this means when your partner wants to have also a career, um, he has to adapt or she has to adapt to this moving from the foreign services. And at least for Switzerland, it's like this, that you don't have a lot of contracts with other uh, or agreements with other countries that your partner can work. It's only when it's vice versa accepted also for Swiss people or uh, Swiss partners of diplomats possible. So this means in a lot of places, unfortunately, the partner will not be able to, um, to, to work. And of course, there are people that enjoy this or they do jobs that they can do from home where they don't need a company or employment um, uh, at the host country, but others have not. And the second issue that it's important to think about 
Um, and this was one of the reasons that I have left. I've left with um, uh, two small children um, when I should have gone again to abroad. Is that if you want to be a good diplomat, um, according to the cultures you are, so China, for example, not, but there are other cultures like Mexico or also in Geneva a lot, where you are supposed to have um, a lot of evenings and sometimes it's each week uh, or each evening in a week um, to have invitations or uh, participating in cultural events or in, in um, uh, um, aperos or whatever that exists because it's part of your job of the relation building. And there it's clear that um, your family life will be a bit suffering because time is um, limited and your children will not be awake uh, when they are very small, very long in the night. And these are things to be considering before you leave for such a posting, also to um, avoid that then you have uh, conflicts in the family um, according to these kind of circumstances. But these are all things that can be negotiated, but have to be done before you're confronted with the problem. And um, most probably for a lot of uh, first time parents is that they don't know yet what it means to be parent. And when they come then also uh, to the situation that one parent is more relying at home on the family work, while the other one has a very full schedule, um, also including the weekends and the evenings, it might be also uh, for the couple a challenge. But this is something that has to be known before and has to be discussed very well before and um, can be combined with some professions much better than with others, I would say. I just retired, so we can give you. Yeah. You, you have a last question? Or Thanks. can we do it informally time. with a drink? <laughs> the timing we had. <laughs> um, we've talked about career, family, what about friends? Can you make friends when you're, yeah, it's part, I mean, for, it's part of my life at least. Is it part of a diplomat's life? Can you have friends when you move so much outside of your embassy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I think is you can forget as a diplomat is you're a human being first and foremost. I mean, it's really important. I think some people, it's like any career. If you get too into the career, you'll forget that your you know, life is about a whole lot of other things. And that means making friendships. And I have to say, it is difficult sometimes to develop these friendships where you're going to have the same kind of thing you did as a kid when you walked down the street and you've known the same family for 30 years. That doesn't exist the same way. But it is so rich. I have so many rich friendships from around the world, and we're still in close touch. And when we see each other, it's as if, it's as if the last you know, 15 years we didn't see each other didn't exist. And you build up bonds with people that you would that you would never be able to do in other places. If you are serving in a really tough place, and you're you know the one you're bringing your kids together to some activity that you you've cobbled together yourself, you're never going to forget that family. I mean the stories we tell about the amazing outings we had, safaris with little infants, you know, with lions walking by. I mean you know you'll never have this elsewhere. You share those moments with people, you will forever love it. And Yes, you build up friendships. And I'd say even here in Geneva, in a place where we're always working and always having receptions, you have to make a bit more of an effort because people are bouncing around so much. But yes, you definitely do. So be a human being, you will. If I may just add quickly, uh, as someone who started in Geneva in multilateralism with this age gap also of people who are usually a bit more old, uh, like a bit older, I have found it quite a challenge at first when I arrived also because you see those people and they represent this country in the rooms and then you sort of feel like, oh, I would vibe with this person on a personal level, but then they represent this, this country. But I think once you go beyond that, you, you do form the friendships and, uh, and then you, you do yeah, have this network of people. It is a bit tough in Geneva, I find, because every summer there's a turnover, so people leave and you do have uh, then friendships around the world, but maybe not physically in Geneva. But I think it's also a richness because then later on you'll move as well and you might find them again. Uh, so yeah, and also I just want to say I do disagree with you on the fact that diplomats are not funny because <laughs> I, I have quite a few friends and they're all funny. So yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> She's saving it for myself. <laughs> Miguel or Carolina, anything to add about friends? Nothing yeah, I always say a good diplomat needs to have very strong roots because that's what really allows you to generally understand different cultures, to know how people think. But you first need to have those strong roots and you need to have friends and uh, stay in touch with your family and get to know and meet new people. I think that's also, you know, along the way. And when you're a diplomat, you get to meet so many different people. Um, on the one hand, it might be for professional reasons. On the other hand, you might as well make new friends. And But it's, it's always good to stay in touch with your, you know, as Mark said, with your high school friends, your uni friends and everyone. I was in touch basically every week um we spoke with, while i was taking the exam with my geneva friends with my institute friends and i'm still in touch with them and i'm actually going to geneva in may uh, i'm going to spend a few days there by the lake so uh really looking forward to it so yeah if you want to become a diplomat you you'd better have good friends too <laughs> maybe to add there uh, the diplomatic life is a very special life. So you have in common a lot with everybody else that has this life is uh, moving each four years somewhere else with the family and so on. And you have also much more time to get to know them um, personally because you know um, with whom they are there, how long they are there, how it was a problem to find an apartment and so on. So you share a lot of experiences um, privately also next to the work that usually with other colleagues at the work, um, I'm less interested because they have the normal life and they, it's not so interesting how they find in the new uh, culture and apartment. But when you are first time in Beijing, it's very interesting how your colleagues from other embassies have found an apartment because it's a nightmare and you think you will never get it. So you have a totally different access to people, what is also giving you the possibility to get to know them uh, very fast on a private way. And this you can build on. And uh, I would say uh, one uh, competence that the um, diplomat really has is to build relationships and building relationships that um, are keeping for a longer time because they are also built on trust. And for this, it's necessary that uh, it's not only because you are there at the moment that you have this relationship, but that you can keep this also over years. And as uh, was told before, when you have uh, had nightmares of um, negotiations throughout um, whole nights, when you have reached then and you have a conclusion and then an agreement is, uh, is reached, this is something that the group of negotiators will never forget. This is, uh, I was at Unstadt in Geneva, the friends from there, when we meet or when it is uh, one year more of uh, what we have uh, reached then, we are totally um, excited and it's it's even more strong, I would say, than with classmates in, in school because it was such a special, hard um, moment, very um, nerve-taking, emotionally very uh, um, tiring also, that when you once have <coughs> done this process, you will not forget anymore. And it's really something that is... Um, giving you the basis for future friendships. Also, when you will not be anymore working together, but uh, because you have got to the person very close in order to be able then afterwards to find an um, agreement, for example, in, in the multilateral thing. So I would say friendship is for sure not a problem, but you need to have time to travel afterwards to see your friends also because they move everywhere. You move and um, it's not a given that you see them. You need to plan to see them again because they are not living at the same place where you are. But this is all possible to organize. Thank you, Carolina. I think it's a great note. And um, before we move, yeah. Oh, yes, just uh, some final words. Thank you, Carolina, Mark, Mathilde, and Miguel. Uh, that was a very inspiring discussion. And thank you, Kevin, for moderating the roundtable. Our next roundtable will take place on Wednesday, 27th of March, from 12.30 to 2 in S8. Uh, and our panelists, we talk about the professional opportunities for um, IHP uh, graduates. So check your emails for the link to register. I also take this opportunity to announce that on the 9th of April, we're organizing a workshop on networking in French, as in a French course on networking. So if you want to train your skills uh, and get ready for the alumni reunion, which is on the uh, 14th of September, follow us 
on Instagram, um, and uh, we also send mails. So now I also uh, invite you to a small uh, coffee break with drinks and snacks. So please, uh, let's all go in the hall. So um, we can also talk with uh, Mathilde and Mike, hopefully, if you can stay just a, few, a few minutes. And for those online, online and those who want to stay to ask questions to Miguel and uh, Carolina, you can stay in the room and uh, still have a, a small conversation. So thank you all, and uh, we should read them. You have questions? I think I have a question. I think there is a question written online. Yeah. Carolina. So once you move out, if you could answer it, maybe. Yeah. So you know that? Well, let me show you my There is a question online. Sorry, I've not got the question. Just wait for. Thank you for sorry, I was outside so I cannot open the camera. Uh, I was so inspired by your speech and I have a question to Carolina. Like I noticed that you shipped from the as from a diplomat to um the NGO leader. So I'm so I'm wondering like what is the difference working in two areas and the motivation of you to transfer from one to another? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. In fact, I was always working for NGOs already as a youngster, but in um, uh, volunteer work and honorary work. So not so much as a profession. In my, my first profession was also for an NGO for child protection. But um, afterwards, I made this choice to go for the diplomatic career very um, uh, deliberately because I wanted also to understand how you can change something from inside systems. So diplomacy and the multilateral system is showing you really much how you can influence and um, contribute to changes within the system and I want to learn this from the basics how to do it and I've um, learned this but uh, after 10 years I had also to tell myself I'm an um, impatient person and when you have the best agreement multilaterally done in the end it's only a paper until it will have some consequences or impact in life for people it will still um, last uh, 10 years or more until everybody every institution in the countries have uh, um, implemented it so i've learned what i wanted in the diplomatic service i enjoyed the time very much but it was then also time again to go to action and the um, ngo world is much closer to action cannot change so much in the system, but it can have an impact on the lives of people. So um, this was my motivation to change. So. Yeah, thank you so much. And I have a small follow up question because I just checked your um, NGO is focusing on the vulnerable groups, especially some asylum seekers like that. So uh, this question is a little bit blunt <laughs> because I feel like the Swiss, um, the Swiss vibe is a little bit um, reserved to immigrants, to other asylum seekers. So for the, you know, implementation, you, you guys meet a lot of difficulties recently. Um, Switzerland was always very conservative and very reserved towards immigrants. It's not something new. Um, I would say right now it's again, we have a more right-winged parliament, so uh, it is getting more difficult. 
And with more crisis in the world, also more this kind of um, idea that we can protect ourselves from the problems in the world when we are um, not allowing people to come in, what is very illusionary. And I think people feel that is illusionary, but still it is a way of um, fighting their own fear. So um, the work has not become different than before, but maybe now it's more important to explain what we are doing and why we are doing it and um, to be um, to show also that, that the success that the country has, Switzerland has, is only possible because of the immigration. So it's always this kind of um, discrepancy of uh, fear of the foreigners. And on the other hand, we would never be there as a country where we are when we would not have this richness and this uh, complementarity of different cultures that uh, made the, this country up since uh, 100 years. And to, to show this and to tell this um, combined with the responsibility that we have with the humanitarian tradition is uh, a task and is uh, something that it's important to do and that I also enjoy doing. So. But the, the challenges are huge. This um, it's true, but I would not um, want to work somewhere where the challenges are not big. So I like challenges. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carolina and Miguel and the organizers for today's event. I think I'm done for my questions. Thank you. Is there any other question? One last question, maybe. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. It was great. It's very thank interesting. you. Thanks so much. It was great. Yes. Thank you so much. And say hi to Karin and say hi to Aline, please. Uh, yes, the outside, but I'll tell them. Okay, yeah, <laughs> say hi, please. Okay, okay. <laughs> great. Thank you All so right. much. Thank for... you so much. Bye thank bye. You.